So yesterday and most of today, I spent my time reading the letters that Michael Berry wrote when he was uh, managing Scion Capital, which is the hedge fund he founded. For those of you who don't know, Michael Berry is a doctor who turned hedge fund manager, made famous by the movie and book The Big Short by Michael Lewis. Um, so he was basically the guy who foresaw the housing market crash in 2007 and was able to bet against it. And he uh, he's always been a kind of interesting figure to me be, because you know he seemed you know the Christian Bale's a great actor. So he really portrayed this guy in a sympathetic light. Like this guy is not a bad guy. He just was an analytical guy who saw what was happening um, and basically just found a way to make money off of it. Unfortunately, he was not in a position to stop it from happening. Um, but since then, you know, reading more of what he's written, he definitely is not hoping for such a crash to happen. In fact, he's very much against the kind of greediness, greed and uh, corruption that led to the housing market crash and the economic meltdown of 2007-2008, um, the global financial panic and the Great Recession. Um, so the reason I, I read these articles was because, you know, I'm actually not a finance guy. Uh, I've taken econ in college, did well, but, um, you know, I've, I'm a software engineer and I'm, I don't work in finance. But um, I've always been intrigued about finance because, you know, when you're in Chicago, which is where I grew up, um, it's a financial hub and you always hear about finance, you know, it's home to Citadel, which is a relatively well-known hedge fund. Uh, it's, you know, you, I had classmates who parents worked in finance. So it was always this whole world to me that I didn't know a ton about. You know, my parents definitely weren't in the field. They've shied away from investing because they don't know how to do it and you know, lost money, <laughs> actually. So, um, but it's clearly an important part of the world and it, it really affects kind of a little bit about everyone's lives um, in a way. Not every single person, but it affects a lot of people's lives. So it has always been a mysterious kind of thing to me that seemed like, oh, yeah, that's a path. Like, that's something you could really learn a lot about. And it would um, it would show you how a lot of why a lot of things happen are the way they are. I um, mean, that just piques my curiosity. I'm just a curious person. Um, but, you know, as a kid, uh, I never really thought, oh, yeah, this is a path for me. I was shied away from money, feeling like, oh, yeah, these are crooks. These are corrupt people. I don't want to be associated with that. I want to do something really positive. Um, but as I'm learning more and more, it's number one, you know, not all rich people are the same, right? Not all finance people are the same. There are a lot of different kinds. Um, some are crooks. Some definitely act in complete self-interest and greed. Um, other people, sure, they act in self-interest to promote, um, to make money, but they're not actively screwing people over, you know. I won't name names, but you kind of know who, who they are. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with someone just buying, so we all, a lot of us just buy stocks, right? We buy stocks and then we try to, we hope it goes up and we make a little money so, you know, we're not, we don't have to work as hard. And that's basically where I'm coming from. Um, in addition to that, you know, my dream would be maybe one day I'll have enough where I can really make a difference. I want to fix a lot of these issues I'm reading about every day, global warming, you know, housing crisis, homelessness, but it's really hard to do it when you work a full-time job just to make ends meet and you don't have a lot of money left over. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, anyway, so here's what uh, you're interested in um, probably is Michael Lewis. I'm sorry, Michael Douglas, Michael, Michael Burr. <laughs> ah, so many Michaels. Um, anyway, so I read his letters um, and they're publicly available. I'll put the, the link in the description. Um, but I just want to summarize for you because, you know, I spent like eight hours reading these letters and all these other documents and, you know, they're, they're pretty dense, to be honest, it's not coming from a finance background, especially. I've heard um, a lot about this. I've read a lot of articles about um, the crisis. I've watched movies, read, watched the movie, The Big Short, in addition to other movies, read books, um, some books, not a ton. Um, so I thought I knew a little bit, but um, even so, this was actually really good for me because I learned a lot already. I mean, my perspective is 
basically, you know, I I read uh, John Boglehead's book, um, The Bogleheads, and it's it's his whole thing, which is a whole other discussion, is about hey, we have these index funds, the S and P five hundred, basically mimic the entire market. Why go through the trouble of trying to pick a few stocks when you just bet with the whole market? It's you know most likely a risk you know minimal risk because uh, it's the entire market, so you don't have to be a, an expert at picking stocks. You just kind of go with the macroeconomic trend of you know, and eventually the trend, the natural trend um, of all these things, you know, is to go up. Inflation goes up generally, and that's generally like the hypothesis there, you know, and it's low cost. Um, it suits most cases pretty well. And we've had a great, what, 10 year, 12 year bull run where stocks have been going up like 17% every year, and people literally have doubled their money if they were invested the entire time. So it's it's been really fortunate. But that doesn't mean it'll always be. And moreover, um, what I learned is, you know, I learned the hard way. I, I, I can't pick stocks just randomly. I don't know. That's probably just a bad idea. Um, but what Michael Burr is saying is that he can pick a small number of stocks, do some research, and find ones that are undervalued. And that's the same thing Warren Buffett does. Um, you know, he's taking a taking his model from Benjamin Graham, which wrote a great book, um, you probably heard of it, Intelligent Investor, about value stocks. So I will definitely link those in the description if you're interested. Just send me a like or a subscribe to let me know. Um, and the point here is, you know, I was not convinced, but after I read uh, these letters, I was pretty convinced. I saw his returns, you know, for like 10 years, and he always beat the S&P 500, even when it was bursting um, in 2001, there's that big dot-com bubble. So how was he able to do it, right? And this is what I'm going to summarize for you today, is what I, in general, learned from him. Um, number one, you know, he, he picks about 15 to 20 stocks. I didn't realize, you know, so few, 15 to 25, compared to the S&P 500, 500 stocks. You know, he's not picking one. He's picking, you know, a medium, medium sized. Um, so I think that's something, you know, that's that seems possible for a lot of people. Number two um, is that he, you know, tries to diversify. You've heard it before. Diversify, meaning don't have everything in one sector because if something happens to one, you're all going down. You spread the risk, and then you have um, sectors that don't correlate. So like hotels is one sector and then tech is another and they're not related. Um, that's just an example. Uh, and three, volatility. He says it's not a risk. So that's something I probably also didn't realize is, you know, vol volatility means when things change a lot. So for example, if the S&P 500 is very jumpy this year, like it goes up, it goes down, up, down, up, down, versus if it goes slow, steady, you know, flat, steady climb, um, some people prefer a steady climb. They think that's less risk. They think that's more predictable. Um, but he argues the opposite, like right? Because here's here's why. So if you have a dollar, it's worth a dollar. Let's say that dollar is very steady. It's one dollar and ten cents because it's so steady. It gets that premium of an extra ten cents. A lot of people like that. Oh, great! It's a dollar ten cents. I love how stable it is. Well, you're not gonna make a lot of money from that. And at the end of the day, it's still a dollar and ten cents. Versus, if that dollar were somehow underpriced at forty cents, then fifty cents one day, and then ninety cents. But it's a dollar. It's worth one dollar, one U.S. dollar. So you you rather want the second scenario because then you can buy that dollar at forty cents, and then buy it again when it goes down to thirty, and then it rises to fifty. So what you you know it's a dollar. So when it reaches finally a dollar at the you know, end of the year, you've made more money. You've made what? If you buy it at thirty cents, you made seventy cents, versus if you just bought at a premium of one dollar ten and never changes. Um, the reason that's a prevailing sentiment is, you know, a lot of people, especially head funds, will use that as a as a measurement of how good their fund is. Um, this was back in two thousand, so twenty years ago. I don't know how prevalent it is today, but um, that's that's just a misconception I I learned about. Um, a third one is a smaller detail, which is basically uh, that 
you know, when you look at how much a company is worth, uh, a lot of people, you know, especially with the tech race today, they'll use options, right? They'll pay their company and they pay their employees in stock. And the way that's calculated uh, and a lot of times is as a tax, tax benefit because if you pay someone in stock, um, the IRS looks at that as a tax benefit. Um, and I won't go into all the details here. That's I can make a separate video if you're interested. Just shoot a comment down to let me know you're interested. Um, and I can explain that to my best of my understanding. Um, but the misconception there is, you know, people will say, oh, wait, that's that, that tax benefit. That's a profit, right? Well, no, actually, that is still a cost because you're paying the employees that. And so when you consider that as a cost, contrary to the prevailing sentiment, again, back in that time, 2000-ish, at least, I don't know about today, then a lot of people thought, oh, yeah, this company is profitable. Like, oh, Adobe is profitable because they caught, thought that it was a, a tax benefit, a profit but really was a cost because you're still paying people. And um, in that case, uh, and, and the reason he says it's a cost is because if the IRS doesn't tax it, it's a cost. If, it, he did, if the IRS is gonna tax it, it is considered a profit and they don't tax it. So um, when you do the math that way, some companies are less profitable than they actually are and their intrinsic value, as he says, is actually lower. So that helps him determine when to buy and what not to buy. Um, and that's just a small interesting detail I learned. I think the larger message to take from that is, you know, there's there's a lot of thinking that goes on. You can't just read everything at face value. You have to think about what it means and make your own assumption because that, that means, oh, maybe there's an opportunity there. Everyone thinks it's that way, but it's, it really is the other way and you're the only one who thinks that that's an opportunity for you to get in and you know make some sort of a position and make money because sooner or later everyone will realize oh yeah that is you know yeah why were we thinking that um and that gets to the next point fifth point is that you know a lot of in theory the market is efficient right so every kind of difference in price will be smoothed out because capitalism you know information will be reflected in the market well that's just one example where information either is misunderstood so it's not correctly reflected or, you know, people just, there's uh, some bias against the stock. Like, ick, I don't want to be associated with this, like, generic brand. It's not as cool as the premium brand, but it's making more money. The generic brand is making more money. You know, like, Aldi's making, maybe, I don't know, but let's say Aldi's making money, but it's not as cool of a brand as Whole Foods. And yet, Aldi is undervalued. Well, that's an opportunity. So... You know, lots of reasons why stocks might be undervalued. Um, I don't know too much about the details. That will be a next next video in the future. Um, but the point is, you know, there there's opportunity to choose a few places. And if you look at the results, you know, when uh, S&P 500 was down 10%, they were up, you know, 10%, 50% in different years, pretty consistently too. Um, and that just goes to show, you know, number one, Yes, in the over the long run, the averages of an S and P five hundred investment will probably smooth out. Pro probably, who knows? But um, it is the least amount of work. But you know, you will have your your down years. Versus, if you choose a few handful of careful stocks, independent of whatever the market, not a representation of the market, just on its own, uh, then you can still make money in a bad year, and then. If you lose money in a bad year, it's very hard to get it back, right? You lose 50%, you have to make 150% to get it back, which is less likely. That's just the way the math works. Um, so there are advantages to being very careful in researching. Um, so I think for my personal next step, I'm going to read a few books. And I'll, I'll, read, I'll list those books out. And these are books that Michael Burr recommended for other people and some famous ones too. Um, like, you know, Benjamin Graham. Uh, and just to get an idea, I, I really want to be able to, I don't know how far I'll get with it, but be able to understand, hey, yeah, this business looks good or this business does not, and maybe, you know, set aside some play money, not, you know, my, my entire savings to say, hey, I think this would be a good investment because, you know, right now I am pretty much heavy in index funds. Um, it'll probably be, be fine, but, you know, honestly, 
um, who knows? And uh, well, I don't know what else to do with my time because you know I'm sure there's so many things to do. I could volunteer, etc. But it seems like um, this this would do a lot in a short amount of time, which you know I'm a little frustrated. Like for example, volunteering, you know, it's great in the moment, but you know, like if we had a non-corrupt government, the government should be able to help people get back on their feet if they want to. We shouldn't have to rely on like the goodwill of everybody pitching time out of their already busy lives to try to do these things. And the only way that's going to be a lasting change, rather than relying on, hey, this random person randomly wants to volunteer, it is to really have that top down and build into the institution. That's what I believe is the best way to go around it in the long term. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do by, you know, like, for example, Andrew Yang, I think he's got a lot of great ideas. And but they're always asking for money and they're asking for time and I don't have a ton of money and I don't have a ton of time. So I'm really hard pressed to say, hey, I, I volunteer I have given more ready quite a bit and I have volunteered quite a bit. You know, I've collected hundreds of signatures. I donated a lot of money, but you know, I can't keep giving more than that. So, you know, I, if I want to do more, I feel like I have to be in a better position myself, to be honest. So um anyway, back to the sum I'll summarize this in the description. Um, but here's a quick summary, just, um, uh, yeah, um, Michael Burr, uh, really great points about value investing, had me convinced that it can really work and it's actually worth pursuing. It's not just smoke and mirrors. Um, and then just a few different ways that how you can, uh, why, why, why value investing would work. All right.